Romans 11, verse 7. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was diligently seeking, but the elect obtained it. The rest were heard, as it is written. God gave the spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they may not see, and make their backs bend continually. I asked them, did they not stumble into an, irre an irrevocable fall? Did they? I'm going to stop there, because I, I know I didn't get there. In the days of this, but we're going to stop reading that. In Romans, in the first four to six verses, first verse four through six, what was the divine response? I have kept myself 7,000 7, 7, people who have not bent the knee to Baal. And so in the same way at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if it is by grace, it is no longer by works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Now, I backtracked. Chapter 11 is rather difficult for me to grasp. Ever since I started Romans, I thought chapter 8 was going to be a little difficult, but I found it actually easy. But there's a lot of stuff in chapter 8, because it talks a whole lot about our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Like I said before, 10, 11, and 12, uh, 9, 10, and 11 are kind of parentheses. You could take them out and go from 8 to 12, and it wouldn't miss a beat. My question has been always been, why is it there? Because it talks a whole lot about the Israelites, about them being rejected, being the chosen people. As I was thinking about this, I thought of the reason God decided He was going to destroy everything that was walking on the earth. The big flood. I thought, now God, why are you putting this in my mind? to destroy everything that was walking on the earth. Their hearts were evil. Their hearts were evil. In Genesis 6, verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of, human, of humankind had become great on the earth. Every inclination of the thoughts of their minds was only evil all the time. So there was nothing else on their minds. They weren't thinking about anything else. Everything they thought about was evil. Kind of reminds of us today, doesn't it? And here's the one that caught me. The Lord regretted that he made humankind on earth, and he was highly offended. The New English translation says he was highly offended. The New King James Version says grieved in his heart. <coughs> now I wondered why is there a change here? What does it mean? So on my faithful computer I have all these word search things, you know, we can look up the Greek and Hebrew words. So when we look at the wording of this, the meaning of this wording, it means that God was offended. 
not just to the point of it being disappointed, but an embarrassment to the point of anger. This means that God was so emotional, and it says it's emotional hurt and emotional pain. He was so emotionally hurt, angered, that he struck out at his creation. And it wasn't just going to be man, it was going to be everything. Everything and anything that walked this earth. The sinfulness of the human race was so painful to God, he decided to destroy it. Which made me ask myself, what sin do I do that causes God emotional pain? My sin causes God pain. The sin that you and I commit is painful to God. We cause an emotional pain. When we look at the judgment of Adam and Eve, what was the judgment for sin to them? children through pain. Adam was told he would work the toil of the soil, be, he would work the ground to get his food through pain. The judgment for sin is pain. The ground is cursed because of you. It will be pain, it will be through painful toil. That's what it says. Every inclination, only evil, all the time. This was the state of man's mind, his life. No wonder God was sorry and grieved in his heart. He had an emotional pain. So he decided to wipe everything out. Did he? No. God changed his mind. <clears throat> Why? See, someone wants to answer, but they're afraid to. No answer's wrong. It might just be different than what I have. <laughs> this is where we run into Noah. guy that made God say, now wait a minute. This one may be okay. Here's a man that did what? Exactly. He found favor and here again you do the word search. It's favor or grace in God's eye. What was it about this man that caught God's eye? He was pure in all his generations. Exactly. And he did what? Love God. He loved God. He walked with God. He had this personal relationship with God. It wasn't the kind of relationship, yeah, I know that person. <clears throat> it was personal. I love that person kind of relationship. Favor or grace? 
Noah was the recipient of God's kindness and mercy because he lived a life that was pleasing to God. He walked with God. I wonder just how close do we walk with God? Noah didn't have the Bible to read to see what was required of God to receive mercy and kindness from God. Noah had to have a relationship with God. Wouldn't that be great to have God just tell you Instead of you having to pick up the Bible and read the thing and study it and meditate on it, and then say, now, Holy Spirit, help me. We have the Scripture to tell us God's desires and wishes for us. Do we read it enough to hear God speaking to us so that we too can walk with God? Or do we cause God pain? Because we're not willing to pick this book up. Meditate, study, and read it. Diligently. Think about this. Did God tell Noah to get on a big boat so that you don't have to be drowned? So you don't want to drown? No. God didn't simply put Noah on a boat and opened up the wells and left the waters flow. Even though Noah walked with God, he found grace and favor in God's eyes. He had to build the boat himself. He had to obey God. Do you think it was easy for him to build that boat? Do you think maybe once or twice he smashed his thumb? Then he got sore and achy in the evening? After a hard day of Cutting timbers and doing what all we had to do to put the thing together. He had to go through pain of building that boat so that we'd be covered by God's mercy and grace. Because sin causes God pain in his heart, we need to go through some pain to a degree for our sinful selves where God's grace and mercy really does have no value for us. Our pain is a reminder that when we sin it causes God pain. When we go before the Lord in repentance, He will show us His love and grace. Now, I'm not saying just because you're feeling pain that you're leading a sinful life. Some of that, my friends, is just from being a senior citizen. Showing a bit more maturity than others. Now, this pain will be in the heart. I don't believe it will be a physical pain, it'll be in the heart. When you're living in sin, there'll be something missing in your life, and you can't figure out what it is. There's a hole there that you can't know what to put in to fill it. It may be that you don't feel God right next to you, and the only way to get close to God is to seek Him. Turn to the Bible. Prayerfully read, study, meditate. 
What does James tell us about seeking God? Draw nigh to God. Draw, draw near to God. And He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and make your hearts pure, you double-minded. This part is up to you. You have to turn to God. You have to make the decision to turn to God. To look to His Word. To hear God. And to listen to Him. God's not going to do it for you. Just the same He didn't build the boat for Noah. You must put in the time and the work in turning to God. And listening. Meditating on His Word. And when you do, he will richly bless you. Any person that is not next to God is there because of their own desires. God doesn't push them away. They cut themselves from God because they will not live in the truth. Now you might be thinking, where's he going with this after the scripture I just read you? From Romans chapter 11, 7 through, I stopped at 11, uh, 13 or 14, I don't know where I stopped. Might have been 7 to 11. Chapter 11. When we look at the Israelites, was it God that cut them off? They had zeal for God, but it was not according to truth. Some failed to obtain righteousness because they tried to get it through works, works ceremonies. We do this, 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 and this during church service, and we don't deviate from it. That's going to give us the righteousness of God. And after I've done this on Sunday morning, I can go through the rest of the week doing whatever I want. The laws of Moses, when you read about them, when you study them, they're all about righteousness. But they turned them into works. Doing things. It didn't change the heart. They stumbled over the cornerstone of salvation. If God had not stepped in with sovereign grace, there would not have been any saved. If God didn't decide, okay, I'm going to save a few for myself. I'm going to keep them for me and reject the rest. There wasn't anything they did. It was all God. He's a sovereign God. He can do what He wants. And this is something that we must remember. There's absolutely nothing in us that is worthy of saving. It is only by the grace of God. Verse 7 says, What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was diligently seeking, but the elect obtained it. The rest were hardened. That don't sound quite fair, does it? Weren't they all doing the same ceremonies? Why would God go out and save some, not all of them? If He had the ability for a few of them, why not extend grace to all of them?
Notice the word. When you don't understand something, reread, reread, reread. Just read it over and over, and you eventually you'll see something that jumps out at you. It wasn't that God just shut them off for no reason. They didn't find what they were looking for. <coughs> Do a little research, and you will find that these people were going at it the wrong way. When they were following the laws, doing all these ceremonies and sacrifices, they made it about themselves. They didn't make it about God. How many church services have you been in? that it really didn't seem like it was about God. We finished this morning's Sunday school lesson up with David wanting to build a church house. That ark was over there in a sloppy old tent. That David just didn't think that was right. He was living in a house of gold and their God was over there in a the tent. How many times do you see where there's a big fancy church house goes up after they've been meeting in a little old four wall with a ceiling on it? They go building a fancy big church house, and what happens next? God gets left out of it. God gets left out of it. It becomes about self and not about God. The Israelites, they read, they read the same Old Testament that I read. The Jews back in that day, in Jesus' time, they were reading the same scriptures that I am reading today. I can see that it's not about the works that God wants to be glorified. It's not by the works. But it's through the heart, by faith. Remember, I talked about what was it, what is it about Noah, Abraham, David. What was it about these people that God said it was their faith? They were searching God's heart. It was their hearts. <coughs> If we don't allow the Word of God to change our hearts, the time will come when our eyes and ears will be covered over and we will be hardened. Why did God say no? What was it about Abraham? It was about their hearts for God, it wasn't their works. Second Corinthians three. Their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when the Mo when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, the one when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. It's not that God decides this one I'm going to save and this one I'm going to harden just because I can. It's because the person allowed himself to be hardened. When you walk away, being as dry as this, this is a good illustration. When you walk away a spring of flowing water, and you walk into the desert, what happens? You begin to thirst.
Do you question why you're coming thirsty? You should know in your mind why you're thirsty if you walked away from the spring and out into the desert. Doesn't this hold true? If you walk away from Scripture, walk, turn away from God, you shouldn't have to question why I thirst for God. Why don't I have God? A point will come when God is going to say, I don't know you. The King James, Isaiah 29, 13. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths, and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the commandment of men, New English translation reads, These people say they are loyal to me. They say wonderful things about me, but they are not really loyal to me. Their worship consists of nothing but man-made ritual. Making it about ourselves, not about God. Making a choice, deciding to walk away from the, what God wants. Yes, one can say all the right things, do all the right way, things in the right way, but if your heart isn't into God, then He will make it so that you cannot see and hear. The table that God prepares for you will become a snare and a trap. God prepares the table before, before, before my enemies. What's he saying? When the enemy, when you start participating with the enemy, it draws you to them and not them to God. The very things that God blesses you with will become a curse. The blessings of God become more important than the leaning on the Lord Himself. Why do you think God or Jesus said the root of all evil is the love of money? How many Christians do you know? that are filthy rich. <laughs> have one back here that says he is. What happens to a person when they have extreme wealth? They start out as Christians, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, giving a tenth, Tithing, the money just keeps piling up. Pretty soon they're counting the dollars instead of the blessings. It's become a curse. In Matthew 13, Jesus says he speaks in parables so that the people don't understand because they have shut their eyes and ears so they don't understand. And he's actually quoting from Isaiah 6. But then in John 12, he repeats, he uses the same passage. But he changes the words. Some people might say, well, he's contradicting himself. My question is this. If a writer of a book wants to quote himself later on in the book, does he have the right to change the wording? Yes. It's his book. So if the Holy Spirit wrote the Old Testament and he wants to use the New Testament but in a little different way, then we better pay attention. 
He uses the different words. Here it says in John 12, verses 39 and 40, that God shuts the eyes and ears. So there is no point, so there is a point in which God will close you off from being able to understand. When you don't want to hear, when you don't want to listen, you ignore God for long enough, He's just going to close it off. He's going to plug your ears up and cover your eyes so you can't see, so you can't understand. Outwardly saying, I know Jesus, but inwardly saying, I don't want to really know you. Will lead to God saying to you, I do not know you. The remnant that is saved, that small group of people that have been saved from the Jews, the Israelites. Are they any different than me and you? I saw some study and now, now the heads are going this way. Yeah, they are Jews. They're God's chosen. But were they the same as you and I? Here in Romans, we see, it says, the Jews and Greeks alike are all under sin. There's no one righteous, not even one. That was in chapter 3. Later on in chapter 3, it says, God is the God of the Jew and the Gentile. No distinction between the Jew and the Greek. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? We are all saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. For us to come to the Father, we must have the Lord Jesus Christ, including the remnant. They are sinners, just like you and I. They have been saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. All who call on Him shall be saved. We will be saved by the grace through Jesus Christ. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and all who call on Him shall be saved by the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before You, thanking You for Your Son, Jesus Christ, that is through Him we have a path to salvation. It is through Him that we get to know You. Thank You, Heavenly Father, for Your Son, Jesus. You saved the Israelites, a remnant. They were Your chosen people. And it is through them that we can see your grace working. Knowing that we too shall be saved. Heavenly Father, as we live our lives day to day, help us to seek you. Open up the path so that we can understand your word. Send the Holy Spirit to speak to us to fill our souls with the knowledge of the 
Lord Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.